hey, this book contains some rape and sexual assault, and it's not given the seriousness that the topic deserves. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, you should skip this episode. The dungeons are real. The dragons are real. The terror is here. Today on this extra spooky episode of Dumpster Book Club, we're talking about Hobgoblin by John Coyne. I'm Sean. And I'm Mimi. And this book is not spooky, just really uncomfortable. (laughs) I don't think we should say the name of the stores we get these books from so strangers can't find us and kill us there's a bunch yeah but it's too close too close oh okay we pick this book up out of the outside bin of a used bookstore the books that they really want to get rid of this book looked super cool i really like the cover of this one it's 3D and bumpy, and Hobgoblin is in sparkly gold. With dragons on either side of it? Yeah, and it's one of those covers that's... It's one of the covers where there's art behind and you open it to see a different picture. On the front, there's a guy in a cage. He's behind a portcullis. In a dungeon. (laughs) Yeah. And you open it up, and it's a guy surrounded by crazy fantasy monsters with armor and axes and stuff and some kind of demon orgy it looks it looks really great and the tagline about dungeons and dragons made it seem like a really fun fantasy D D themed book i was thinking looking at this it could have been symbolic of the main character's inner struggle you know caged by his imagination and the game <laughs> The, the world looking at him from the outside as he's enslaved by his imagination, but on the inside, it's very rich and colorful. That's not the story we get. That would be nice if that, that was the book. It's obvious the person who designed this cover and wrote the tagline and summarized it on the back of the book never read the book. The summary on the back of the book is extra terrible. It is not anything similar to the book we read. It manages to list monsters on the back of the book that aren't mentioned in the book, which is ridiculous because the book mentions so many monsters, obscure and strange, but it doesn't mention gorps. (laughs) Blood spewing gorps. And there's no bats. There's no flesh hungry ground bats. There aren't even dungeons or dragons in this book. Nope. Instead, we get a sort of pseudo coming of age tale that quickly devolves into a headlong dive into awkward and uncomfortableness. <laughs> um, I did a bit of research on John Coyne, which was easier than usual with these obscure authors because he runs his own personal website and blog. <laughs> Does he blog about things? Mostly golf. (laughs) Uh, It proudly lists the 25 books that he's written. Uh, Looking through his bibliography, half of his books are instructional how-to guides, mostly about golf. And out of the 12 or 13 novels that he's written, three of those are also about golf. Like fiction about golf? Yeah, The caddy who won the Masters, the caddy who played with Hickory, and the caddy who knew Ben Hogan. I don't, I've never read very many sports books. I think I read a Mighty Ducks novelization when I was really little. (laughs) But I can only imagine a a sports book is, oh, am I going to do the thing? It's really hard. I might not do the thing. I've done the thing. Or at least that's what the Mighty Ducks book was like. (laughs) I've never read a book about golf. It seems like the worst sport to write about. Yeah, I hit the ball with the putter. (laughs) I missed the hole by five inches. I have to putt again. He also includes an FAQ section, but almost every answer is also about golf. 
What has to happen for you to feel like you've had a good writing day? Write 1,000 words before noon so that I can play golf in the afternoon. And what's your next project? Breaking par for 18 and publishing a bestseller. (laughs) I'll take either one and be happy. Do you think he has actually frequently asked any of these (laughs) questions? Because I doubt he's he's an exceptionally good golfer where he has a bunch of golf fans asking him about golfing. And it doesn't seem like he has a big following of readers. So who's asking all these questions? Oh, you know, it says he's a bestseller. So I'm guessing someone has read these books. I'm just not sure who. I think this book is a bit more popular than what we would consider our standard fare. But we sort of bent the rules a little bit in for the sake of Halloween. And we were punished for it greatly. Anyway, enough about this golf garbage. Let's talk about this book garbage. (laughs) Okay. Uh, You got that line. uh, What? You got that line. You know what's happening. What do you mean? Do I? What what does that mean? We're talking about chapter one. (laughs) (laughs) Chapter one opens with Scott playing... Hobgoblin, which is the game that this book gets its title from. Hobgoblin is described as being similar to Dungeons and Dragons or Traveler or RuneScape. RuneQuest. Oh, I guess video games didn't (laughs) exist in 1981 when this book was written. Or maybe, I don't know, when video games happened. (laughs) Either way, Scott is very popular for introducing everyone to this game and also having the best character, Brian Boru, his level 25 paladin. The first clue that this author has never actually played a role-playing game before, thinking that anyone would care that someone else has a high-level character in anything. But especially in a pen and paper role-playing game where the the stats are made up. And oh my god, how do I say this? No what are you one, trying to say? No one cares if you're powerful in D and D. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you can write ninety nine in every stat on your character sheet, and it's no one will be impressed. Okay, sorry. We're also introduced to Barbara, who I think we are both in agreement is actually the main character of this book. Though John Coyne holds firmly that it's Scott, and he believes that all the events of the books revolve around Scott, though he makes no action to interact with the plot at all. There are a lot of weird hints at Barbara and Warren having a bit of a dark relationship. She, It's from her point of view, and it kind of describes how sometimes Warren hurts her without realizing because he's so careless with her strength. She's extremely passive and submissive and just kind of doesn't say anything and and I I think later in the book also there's just kind of it's described as Warren being like extremely forceful and also he like he was in Vietnam and brags about it is the word for that yeah he Um, seemed to have a great time in Vietnam it mentions that sometimes he made her feel like a child or treated her like a child and i think john coyne's intention was to just portray barbara as having given up on her dreams to have a family and security but there was always a little bit too much and it came off a little bit too sad where her her arc is a bit greater and grander than john coyne intended I I refuse to believe that John Coyne could write as interesting a character as Barbara. And based on most of the Barbara in the book, I agree with myself. I was right. (laughs) Because most of her, most of the stuff she's in is just boring and awkward. But I've sort of imagined Barbara as this great woman in my head. Anyway, Warren dies of a heart attack. And this is the catalyst that begins the story and sparks a lot of the problems. The whole first chapter is written flipping back and forth between Scott playing Hobgoblin and Barbara and Warren at home. And so 
Warren's heart attack coincides with Scott's unbeatable paladin, Brian Boru, being killed by the Brobdingnagian. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Boru is supposed to be Scott's... Scott's... 25th level paladin? No, he's supposed oh. to be his analog to his father. Oh. So when he becomes Brian Boru, he's calling forth his father. Oh. So that's why they both died at the same time. And that's why. He... Wow. I missed that connection. Uh, I thought they hammered it in pretty obviously. <laughs> there were quite a few times when there were flashbacks to his father. <laughs> yep. And he talks about how Scott's game is just is just Scott trying to connect with his father and his Vietnam experiences, and Scott thinks of his dad as a paladin. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, this this chapter is unimportant. It just sets up the background that Scott's father has died, and he liked his father a lot. Oh. The only other interesting thing about this chapter is how many bees are in it. I wrote down all of the unique proper nouns that start with bees. So Barbara, our our pseudo main character. Who goes by Ba as a nickname. <laughs> Not Barb. <laughs> bah. <laughs> bah. <laughs> I don't want pizza tonight. <laughs> I want veal. <laughs> and there's Brian Boru. There's the battle board. TM for Hobgoblin. <laughs> the few monsters that they do fight in this first game are the Banshee, the Boobock, some Baganes, a Barrel White, and the Brobdingnagian. Did I say that right? Yeah. I looked it up. The Brobding Dong. <laughs> there is also battle points. There are the Boatmen. And a lot of this first game is taking place in Black Sod Bay. Oh, wait, that's all of them. Oh, no, no. There's Billy Blind, who's another player character that he's playing with. Um. <laughs> but Scott and Barbara move to Bailey's Castle, where Barbara has taken a job cataloging all the antiques there for the owners to sort of assess a value. Yeah, the next chapter jumps about... Uh, nine months later, so it's set in the fall at Bailey's Castle, Bali Castle, Bali's 24-hour fitness. <laughs> Just call it BBs. <laughs> and they are living on the grounds of the castle, which uh, sort of exacerbates Scott's problems. Uh, after his father's death, he has receded farther into his imagination, starts imagining himself as Brian Boru, uh, imagining himself as his father. He starts feeling that the monsters are real. Sometimes he sees Barbara as a monster. Um, but this is all a little bit quaint because while John is trying to... Quaint? This is all a bit contrite. Contrite? But this is all a bit silly because as John tries to convince us that Scott has problems with his imagination and trying to escape from the real world and accepting his father's death, it becomes very clear pretty quickly that Scott does have actual mental illness, and it may have been there before his father died. Scott crazily switches from happy to sad to mad haphazardly, with no real description of the change. He's just flipping back and forth for seemingly no reason, or he's f he's flipped on by very small... To the point of where he's almost violent, but then immediately kind of joking and trying to be friendly again the next minute yeah he goes from wanting to strike people to joking around within within a dialogue space and he doesn't seem to understand his effect on other people he can't comprehend other people's reactions to the way he's just terrible to them sometimes on top of dealing with the mental illness and his father's death he's also been completely removed from all of his friends to a new school where 
No one's ever heard of Hobgoblin. Which is his main passion. He gets moved from sort of a city setting to a, a rural area where no one's heard of the games he likes. That's one thing I think this book did pretty well, actually, is the sort of, is the new kid experience at a high school. It explains a lot Scott's struggle to figure out what's cool and what's not cool and which slang words are the right to use and which get you laughed at. There's a big long scene where he tries to figure out where the parking space is and he ends up pissing off a few jocks with his fancy new car. They're all they're all sort of farmers here and they they all have to take the bus and he comes in with a sports car from his father. It also clearly shows adult stupidity in all things high school. Both his parents and other adults don't seem to understand why he has trouble fitting in. They think that if he just explains why Hobgoblin is cool, everyone else will think it's cool. It's that typical parent thing. If my child thinks this thing is great, obviously other teenagers would think it's great. You just gotta you just gotta tell them about it. They don't understand that high school is not about expressing yourself or being earnest in any way. It's about trying to hold everything you care about to your chest and never letting <laughs> anyone know. <laughs> And just hoping to God no one finds out that you actually like something because then they'll never let you hear the end of it. You have to be completely aloof and ironic about all things except for the few things that are allowed, which Scott is trying to figure out. I think one of Scott's biggest mistakes is talking to anyone. <laughs> well, he, he, he has his problems. It's not his fault. <laughs> he would have been much better off just... Hang out at the castle. Don't talk to anyone. That's what I remember thinking that in high school is, is I'll make it through. I just don't talk to anyone. Go to my classes. Read my books. No one will bother me. But that's not how it works. They will find you. And they will find what you care about. And they will try to take it from you. Just need to find better hiding places. That's what I did. (laughs) (laughs) Um... Scott manages to get himself on the wrong side of the the biggest jocks and bullies in the whole school. Uh, Nick Borges and Hank Simpson. Hank Simpson's supposed to be a joke. Did the Simpsons and King of the Hill exist in 1981? No. <laughs> oh. I don't understand why these two seem to have so much power over the school because it seems like everyone would hate them. Every day, they stand at the most crowded intersection of hallways in the middle of the school, the Times Square of the campus, and grab people's butts as they walk past. Although, they do grab each other's butts all the time, too. (laughs) It might just be a thing at this school. (laughs) Um... There's some pretty great lines when they're interacting with Scott, like shouting, I'll cream your ass. (laughs) (laughs) And later, Scott's concern, now everybody's gonna be after my ass. Yeah, see, just in this area, butts are a thing. It's not not a big deal, guys. We're all just touching each other's butts. Some butts (laughs) are getting creamed. Some people are after some people's butts. Just in the school tradition. School thing. Um. And in this first half of the book, the bullies are pretty scary, but they're not so insane. And it all kind of reads as if it's a children's book. For a lot of this first half, I was sort of, I thought it was kind of aimed at 10 or 11 year olds and Scott could be kind of like an older person they aspired to be like. He had his imagination, he liked playing his games, he struggled with school bullies and stuff. I expected these all to be things that kids could relate to. Uh, Disagreements with your parents, meeting a girl you like and not really knowing how to move forward. Even the way the book is written kind of seems like it's, I think an 11 year old could easily fly through this book as well as we did. There's nothing too complicated or hard to understand there's a lot of subtext that we picked up on but i don't think john coin intended for that subtext 
At this point in the book, I wrote a prediction, and I want to read it in full now so you can see just how far off I was. <laughs> if anyone followed along, I wrote this at chapter five. So however much information we all have at chapter five, that's what I was going off of. Here's my prediction. Scott accidentally summons an evil Irish monster, a hobgoblin, probably from an old book found in the castle his mom is working for. The hobgoblin sees Scott as his master and begins killing all the people he hates, using the list in his notebook that he keeps of everyone who wronged him. But that includes his mom and his new girlfriend, and he has to stop it before it kills them too, using the history found in the castle by his mom and her research combined with his knowledge from the game Hobgoblin. Wow. What a fun adventure this book is (laughs) going to be. There was a much more likely trajectory for the plot from, from this point. Yeah, the Goosebumps version. I was also somewhat expecting the Mazes and Monsters version, where Scott gets pulled deeper into his madness and the occult and commits some kind of violence, and it's all blamed on the evils of imaginative role-playing. But we didn't get that at all. I think that was more likely a story just based on what we know now. That doesn't seem like a very fun, friendly kid story, which I was... I really liked the first, you know, seven chapters of it. Well, really liked is a strong word, but I was, I was along, like I was, I was down for the ride. I was ready to do a silly kids book. John Coyne definitely seemed like a pretty competent writer. Um, it was easy to read and easy to read quickly, but do you think that's because he's a competent writer? How many times did people smile wryly in this book? (laughs) Well, I think his biggest problem is not being able to write people that act like real people. He had some trouble with people that exist. So, yeah, the the word wryly shows up 14 times. People smile wryly throughout the book. It felt like like more. It felt like more, but that doesn't include all the times that people stated something coolly or bit their lip. And I don't think people actually do those things. Certainly, John Coyne's more competent than Brian M. Ball. (laughs) This book was a... This book was the sweet release. It was a pleasure to read. Compared to probably the man. It was... It's double the length, and it felt so much shorter. I also got the sense from the writing that it was intended to be adapted into a movie. I think a lot of these scenes make more sense imagining them shown visually without all the bizarre inner thoughts. Um, Well, maybe a good example would be their weird, awkward romance between Scott and Valerie. She's the one friend that he's made at school. Though she has no real reason to be friends with him other than that she finds him physically attractive. Yeah. And we know that he's physically attractive because his Spencer Town Academy English teacher describes him as attractive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, while Valerie and Scott are hanging out, they have a play fight And this whole scene, I'm pretty sure, was meant to be a romantic flirting scene, I think was the intention. But some of the words used to describe it make it sound a little bit scary, where in a movie, what might have been kind of playful slapping is described as swinging wildly, and Valerie inwardly thinks it felt good to be hitting him. Scott falls... And she falls kind of on top of him, pinning him to the ground. Then he starts, like, yelling and swearing at her and begging her to let him go. (laughs) Um, And then his mom walks in. But I can definitely see that scene play out in a movie. The characters don't respond to it as if it was actually a violent or scary scene. But the words that are used make it feel that way. What would be pretty uncomfortable in this movie version and makes this whole scene very uncomfortable in the book is that right before this romantic yet 
horrifying scene is that Valerie walked in on Scott attempting to kill himself with a razor. Uh. And his main thoughts in his head is that he's going to punish his mother. And before and after this moment, he doesn't seem to dislike his mother so much that he would want to kill himself. He just has problems and needs help. And Valerie walks in on this, and then they have their weird, aggressive sexual interaction. This is the first time that Valerie comes to meet Scott. She thought up the excuse of bringing him books for his homework, and then she finds out he's not there, and she gets super mad for no reason, but then she hears the water. And her first thought is, Scott left the water on. How rude. I'm going to go up there and turn it off. And well, then he's up there trying to kill isn't himself. That, isn't that weird? I mean, it sounds like he's taking a shower and she, like, creeps into his house and then Im- imagines going through Barbara's dresser because she likes Barbara's outfit so much she wants to... Yes. There is some weird sexual tension between Barbara and Valerie, as well as some weird sexual tension between Barbara and Scott. And some weird sexual tension between Barbara and Derek. And some weird sexual tension between Barbara and Connor. And then there's some weird sexual tension between Barbara and the jocks who are bullying Scott. (laughs) Um, oh yeah. Barbara does whisper something to Scott as if they were lovers. (laughs) Valerie puts up with a lot when she's dealing with Scott At some points, he threatens to beat her up. He's almost threatening to kill her. He also has some great lines like, I'm not like all boys. I like to imagine Valerie realized that he has a problem and believed that he wasn't dangerous to anyone other than himself. She seemed, there are a few moments where it talks about how she's learned to recognize his mood swings that the reader never (laughs) learns to recognize. In my brain, I blissfully imagine that Valerie is completely aware that Scott is, has a mental problem and is trying to help him along, and then is also just like a weird sex pervert in that she wants to have sex with him too. (laughs) Um. So now we're talking about Barbara. Okay. All of Barbara's sections simultaneously read like a cheesy soap opera with her... (laughs) falling in love with Derek but then pulling away because it's it's not right and then a sitcom style tv mystery adventure it's almost like Barbara's part of the book is Buffy have you ever seen Buffy no no I'm not saying it's Buffy and I haven't seen Buffy it's the idea of Buffy but really bad have you ever seen the show no do you know what it's about I hate Joss Whedon Um, so Barbara's job at the castle is to document the history, but as soon as she starts to stumble on some of the actual history, the director of the historical foundation that owns this castle starts to shut it down and tells her to stick to documenting the f- the furniture, right about the the artwork and you know her the- job. <laughs> Well, and, Please, Barbara, just do your job. <laughs> uh, but she feels she stumbled upon a big scandal, and every time that comes up, Derek is worried about losing funding for, you know, both of their jobs. So I think they're in Michigan or New York or somewhere, um, but the castle was built exclusively out of stones brought there from Ireland by uh, Fergus, um, who also imported a bunch of indentured servants from Ireland, one of them being Connor, the last of the original inhabitants left at the castle. He's supposed to be the caretaker, but mostly just pops up to give people a scare. Yeah, the first half of the book doesn't have any real horror elements, but it just has a lot of Barbara wandering around spooky parts of the castle, and then Connor happens to be there. He appears as a figure with a knife, but he's just polishing some daggers, 
and he knows his way around the castle, so he always disappears without a sound. But he's also developing a friendship with Scott and really exacerbating his mental illness by telling him stories about Irish hobgoblins. And he keeps making or giving him ancient weapons. He gives him a shillelagh and a slingshot. Barbara has to tell him multiple times to please stop giving Scott weapons. And then he gives Scott a pistol and a sword. I guess Barbara and Scott are both kind of investigating the same mystery, but from different angles. Um, they find the graves of ten young girls who all died in their late teens or early twenties, one after the other, after about a year of working there at the castle. Connors mentioned some of these girls in his stories as ones who were eaten by hobgoblins but Barbara is investigating it as a serial killer or something. Meanwhile, Barbara is engaging in a super awkward romance with her boss, Derek, the director of the foundation. I wrote down a couple of examples of their flirting and just wanted to read that. Okay, their date, which goes something, just something like this. So the date starts with Barbara crying. Then Derek thinks to himself that she would be a perfect fit for his house. Then Barbara says not to kiss her because she feels dizzy and might pass out. So Derek suggests having dinner. Barbara says she can't eat because of her stomach being in knots. So Derek says, okay, let's make love. Barbara agrees with her eyes. They have sex. Then Barbara cries again. This time it might be happy crying, but it's not clear. And then it ends with her admiring his tiny butt. But none of that matters, because the book actually starts happening right about now with the appearance of the black anus. <laughs> Sean! <laughs> Which is a kind of hag witch woman <laughs> who wanders the forest and can shapeshift. <laughs> Right. Scott and Valerie get home and there's an old woman running around in the woods, which Scott believes is a black anise. And Scott runs off and chases it in the woods to various success. At the same time, Barbara's home alone and the black anise visits her by trying to get in the house by rattling the doorknobs. And pressing her face up against the glass and the windows. And here I feel like was the only effective horror scene in the book. It was fairly spooky. Someone's trying to get in the front door and Barbara realizes that the back door is unlocked and Barbara has to run to the back door before it can get there and open it. And she, she just makes it lightning flashes and she can see the face of the black anus. <laughs> and it's a horrible old woman with one eye who's gasping at her like a fish. One of the reasons I thought this might have been written with the intention of making it into a movie is in every one of these scenes, Barbara's also just gotten out of the shower, and there's at least a paragraph describing how naked she is. I just chalked that up to a John Coyne thing. <laughs> he really likes describing nude women. But the, the black anus finally goes away, and the security writes it off as if it's a bag lady. Yeah, I like some of Derek's suggestions, though. Like, maybe she was just a tourist from a mental hospital. <laughs> I don't think I really knew the term bag lady. I'm not sure I understand what a bag lady is. Oh, you... Your parents ever told you you were dressed like a bag lady? Because <laughs> no. I heard that a lot. <laughs> That's a bad thing to look like a bag lady, I'm assuming. Uh. <laughs> Was there a rash of bag ladies in the 70s and 80s? What are bag ladies? I think they're just homeless. Oh, that's sad. Um, but there's there's a little hint that Derek does know what's going on, and there's 
a scene with him calling Connor saying she's got out, but... They play the whole Derek knows what's going on thing a few times in the book. And I thought it was pretty dumb because he does know some things, but in the end he actually didn't. And he wasn't hiding. He wasn't hiding any of the horror elements. He just thought there was another person on the grounds and he decided not to tell Barbara about it. It's not like he knew that there was a killer on the grounds or something. It was just another red herring that this book is full of. But instead of keeping you guessing with all the red herrings, you just kind of get annoyed and bored. (laughs) I would rather have some spooky scenes or some characters or anything. It's not really a story if you just spend the first 200 pages of the book posing possible villains and scenarios. And then in the last 50, it was actually this one. (laughs) The one we never hinted at. (laughs) Yeah. Well, after the Black Annis, Scott and Valerie play Hobgoblin. Yeah, so right after a crazy bag lady tries to break into their house, and Scott chases a Black Annis in the forest, I'm guessing the next night, they decide to stay over at his house again, and Barbara leaves them unattended. Yep. It's th- it's the next night after <laughs> someone tried to break into their house while she was there. Yep. This chapter though is the turning point of the book. The book was all fine if not disjointed and boring till now. This is the precipice that the book reaches and then leaps off of into <laughs> some of the worst garbage I've ever read. <laughs> Um, And it all starts with Hobgoblin. (laughs) So how do you play Hobgoblin? Okay, do you want to start with how to actually play Hobgoblin, and then we'll get into the reality of playing Hobgoblin with Scott? Sure. Okay. I'm assuming you have a better grasp of how to play it than I do. I know all checks are made with three pyramid die that somehow give you results between 0 and 99. Okay, but the most infuriating part of this is they roll three pyramidal dice, which should have sides 1 to 4, and the result, (laughs) (laughs) 98.6. And there's there's no extra adding or subtracting going on. He just rolls three dice and reads the results, and I don't even know how you could get results... I do know. You can't. (laughs) We don't get all the rules, but this seems to be the main do an action and check your results mechanic of Hobgoblin is roll the three pyramid dice. Also, they describe the cube dice, which are just regular. Yes. Most die are cube. So they roll one cube die. The result is nine. (laughs) And I know that that isn't added to the stat because they add the stat to get 17. That's not totally impossible. The cube die could be custom. What are the four numbers on the pyramidal die (laughs) that give you... They give you a range of 100 numbers? (laughs) With decimal points. Before even that, there's character creation. (laughs) You start character creation... By picking from a giant list of classes. Well, there's five racial types, but we don't know what they are besides human, I think. Oh no, someone plays as a banshee. Yeah, I thought you could pick any monster in the monster manual, but does it say five race classes? It said five. Okay. And uh, some of the, the classes that you pick, some of the options, Miller, Barmaid, Farmer's Wife... Sea captain, thief, damsel in distress. <laughs> the worst class possible. Uh, that's the one that Valerie chooses. I'm a little confused about what type of game this is supposed to be because there's the battle board, which has min like you have miniatures, there's cardboard forests, you have to build this whole thing to play on. Like a miniature game. It's a role-playing game in that you get a role, you pick a role, you get a card that gives you your stats, 
and you have a miniature you move around on the board to interact with things that are usually cards drawn from a deck. Okay. And okay. you have a goal that you have to get to. It's kind of like a war game with heavy RPG elements. I think there was also a little bit of contradictory information, maybe not exactly contradictory, from chapter one, the best part is the storytelling, but this is also a game that's almost entirely chance-based. After you pick your character, you're given your card, and then the things you interact with are also drawn from a deck of cards. The dealer, which is the DM, doesn't actually pick many of these things. They're all drawn randomly from the cards, and there's no hidden die rolls. You have to show everything. So it doesn't seem like there's very much opportunity for storytelling, except extracting the story from what happens based on the cards. Okay, so the four stats that you have... You get told your stats after you pick your class? Yeah. So there's constitution, intelligence, luck, and wisdom. But it seems that the damsel in distress has an additional stat of virtue. So, damsels must have a high virtue value or else they can be seduced by knights or highwaymen. I can't even blame this on Scott being a horrible game master because he rolls a die to determine the adventure and just reads the adventure straight out of the book. <laughs> oh man, I guess I did interpret it as Scott being a terrible person, but it's it really isn't his fault. He's just super into a very rapey RPG game. Yep. <laughs> and, you know... Scott almost try he tries to warn her also before they start. She decides to use her middle name as her character name. And Scott tells her that you're not supposed to use your own name because then you'll feel really bad if your character gets raped by a gang of dwarves. <laughs> okay, well, should we talk about this adventure? Yeah, did we cover all the, all the mechanics we're given, though? Okay, there is one more mechanic that I want to talk about, but it comes up in the game, so we should just talk yeah. about mm -hmm. their actual game. Yeah. Their game is the absolute worst nightmare of an RPG session. <laughs> the yeah. thing you fear most happening when you sit down to play art an RPG with strangers is what happens. <laughs> yeah. And this is the this is how he's gonna introduce Valerie into Hobgoblin, get her into the hobby. So Valerie picks the... The damsel in distress, and they roll for an adventure, and the adventure, straight out of the handbook, her character waking up to an attempted rape. That was the adventure? Yes. I thought it was she had to... I thought she was promised to marry oh, a no, count, no, no. and she had to go get to him to marry him. That's adventure number two that they go on. Okay, so adventure seed number one is you're about to be raped. Yeah, you wake up in your own bed and someone is there. She uses her intelligence. Wait a second. Let me let me let me pull this up because I need to. Damsel in distress seems a pretty poor choice for a class in a role playing game and a poor choice to pick if it's your first game. Yes. I bet a super advanced player could could play a damsel in distress. Oh, like picking the tourist in NetHack when you're real good. Yeah, it's hard mode where every time you try to do something, there's like a 30% chance you're going to get raped by a highwayman. Okay, well, pretty much she gets away by screaming. And then the bad guy runs out the window and falls to his death. Which Valerie is unhappy about. That's how the game is played. <laughs> And she doesn't get any EXP? How do you get to 25th level Paladin? <laughs> yeah, that's not explained. But then there's adventure number two, which is also an attempted rape. When's the part where she has to go marry the person? I thought that... Uh, yeah, she was, she was on a journey to go marry this person, but then she encounters highwaymen. So at this point, Scott brings in... His character, Brian Boru, to save the day. Yes, the DM self-inserts his own NPC. 
and we get some actual combat, which was insane. Yeah. Okay, this is the thing. The combat rules to this game are complete insanity. It requires a pocket calculator because the numbers we're working with are four in the four digits. The attack points are rolled for every highwayman. Which is the three pyramid die that can be zero to 99. But they roll eight, four, and 12, which add up to 24. And then you multiply that by the basic strength. That gets multiplied by 3 and 72. (laughs) And he gets 5,184 and compares that to Brian's attack value of 2,040. I think the extraneous numbers were kind of whatever, but the main point you pull from this is in Hobgoblin, if you engage more than one enemy in combat, their stats are added together and then multiplied by the number of opponents you're facing. Yes. So fighting more than one enemy is suicide in this game. Um, fortunately, Brian Boru has a sacred sword, but he fails his sacred sword roll. This only really came up in his the encounter in chapter one uh, at the school where Brian Boru was originally in trouble. He starts rules lawyering and telling people to check page 108 if they don't believe him but since brian boru has over four hundred thousand battle points that means he has arcane powers and rolling over a four on a cube dice means he gets one wish which means there's a one in three chance of getting a wish whenever he wants which is like one of the most game-breaking things you can have Well, maybe not in Hobgoblin. But you can wish to turn back time. (laughs) But anyway, he doesn't he doesn't go for the the wish role in his game with Valerie, but Valerie suggests maybe her character can help fight. Maybe I could play the game too, DM. (laughs) Could I play your game? (laughs) But no. There's no option for her to do anything helpful except the option to offer up your life, which seems to be a special rule where you can sacrifice your character for the greater good. Yeah. Why isn't there group combat on the PC side? (laughs) Yeah, why can't they add up their numbers and multiply them? But also the rules specify that if you do this action, you're not allowed to run a different character and you're out of the game. Yes, you can never play Hobgoblin again if your character dies Please in Hobgoblin. Please leave. <laughs> oh my god. That's, that's real life, man. This game's tough. Then this part didn't even make sense. Scott suggests that Brian Boru could call upon her to sleep with him because then she wouldn't be a virgin and these highwaymen wouldn't want to rape her then. Was but- that what it was? Yes. Okay. But this is in the middle of combat. This whole section was a swirl of terrible, so I might have misconstrued it. Then they give up on this game and kiss and touch each other. This is that classic scenario where you bring a girl over to your house and decide to DM a sexy RPG (laughs) for her and put her in a bunch of raucous sexy situations so that she can get all riled up and then when the time is right you bring in your own npc character and suggest they sleep together because (laughs) then she'll be thinking about sleeping with you (laughs) and then she'll just be begging for it by the end of the game (sighs) but She's pretty much just begging to stop playing this game. It's horrible. So imagine this whole horrible situation. But this whole game, with all of the rape and really uncomfortable dialogue between Valerie and Scott, is intercut with Barbara's date with Derek and their sex scene. Yes. Which is awkward and comfortable in its own right. But when you go back and forth from this nightmare... RPG full of sexual assault to their like pet
passionate food and love making <laughs> and crying <laughs> situations. Yeah. It's just a it's real rough. Fortunately, all of this is interrupted by the black anus making another appearance. Thank God for the black <laughs> anus from saving us. Um and they have to hide in a room until till Barbara gets home and then the figure of Brian Boru is missing. Yeah, they never bring that back up. No. He never finds the Brian no, Boru figure again. It didn't matter. He doesn't have like a moment with it where he like decides he doesn't need it anymore. The Brian Boru figure is just gone. It's gone and we never find out why. They could have also just not mentioned it again. That's how they know someone was in the house. <laughs> it just seems like you sent most of this book is they're setting up for something and then they just forget about it. <laughs> Anyway, the this whole time, Scott has also been periodically attending school, and his conflict with the bullies has been escalating over how weird he is for playing Hobgoblin. Or So at first, their, their pranks on Scott are things like they tackle him extra hard in football, but... Well, they give him a concussion. That's how you play football, isn't it? It is, but they they did a move purposefully to, like, hurt his head. Okay, yeah. It's pretty... Like, concussions are not a joke. They're pretty serious, actually. They kind, they probably messed him up even more. Well, I mean, from there, like, it escalates to where, you know, they get him on the ground and they're kicking his head. Yep. They go from just really scary bullies to just villains. From from there, they go to stealing Scott's car with Valerie in it, driving her out to the graveyard, assaulting her, and leaving her tied up and blindfolded on Fergus's grave. Uh, then they break into Scott's house while Barbara is home alone and just out of the shower. And then they sexually assault her, too. Yes. And steal some things from the house. So after these horrible events, later that night, Scott, Valerie, Barbara, and Derek have all met up and figured out what's happened with these bullies. And they discuss whether or not they should call the police. And Valerie says no and says they didn't actually hurt me, which is not true because they did. They did. They punched her. And yeah. kicked her. Yeah. And Scott says that he'll only get into more trouble at school. And I thought this was insane because there have been, there's two adults and two children as witnesses to car theft, kidnapping, false imprisonment, assault, battery, attempted rape, breaking and entering, burglary, and they decide to just let it go. Yeah, we'll be really awkward in school. <laughs> Well, once Scott is back at school in Mr. Russell's class, Mr. Russell tries to incorporate role-playing and the history of role-playing into their class. He's discussing chess, war simulation games, he brings up Dungeons and Dragons, and invites Scott to talk a little bit about Hobgoblin. It just seemed a little irresponsible to me. Because I don't think Mr. Russell realizes how much rape is in this game. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that. I just spent the whole time thinking about how horrible it would be to be called upon to explain something you're passionate about to your classmates. Yeah, and Scott, he makes a genuine attempt. Bad idea. Yeah. Uh, everyone laughs at him. It escalates until Mr. Russell has no control over the class. Scott yells at everyone that his character will kill all of them and <laughs> runs out of the classroom. I just imagine Mr. Russell, like, at home, kind of reflecting on this day and his choices. But <laughs> for some reason, after these events, Valerie's friend Tracy decides they should hold the school Halloween dance at the castle. And everyone can go as hobgoblin characters. Valerie's trying really hard to get everyone in the school 
into Hobgoblin, and I don't know why based on her experience with it. (laughs) Every time Scott has tried to explain Hobgoblin to these kids, it's ended horribly for everyone. Um, But he agrees to this dance idea, and he basically has free reign to plan this dance, um, including creating characters, stats, and mandatory costumes for every student in the school. All of Scott's costume guidelines are mandatory and enforced at the door, and he makes up his own hide-and-seek version of the game, which really had nothing to do with Hobgoblin and required no stats whatsoever, but I don't know about this game. Valerie wants her friend to be a different character because she thinks she won't like that type of monster. But Scott says it will take hours to rebalance the teams. But it's just hide and seek. (laughs) That's the culmination of this book. The book all leads up to a bunch of high school kids playing hide and seek, dressed up as monsters in a spooky castle. And Scott's ultimate plan here is to get revenge on all the bullies. But his plan to get revenge is that they're all on the same team. Valerie's playing a ghost who can tag people. Is she a ghost? She's some hobgoblin character. Okay. She's... Sorry. She can tag people and they, <laughs> they're out. So she's supposed to tag only the bullies so that they're so embarrassed that they were the only ones who got tagged by a girl. Yep. He's going to get back at them for the physical and sexual assault of his girlfriend by embarrassing them that they're bad at hide and seek. (laughs) But in order to to get to that point, he's just counting on them to respect the rules of the game and sending Valerie alone in a dark castle to tag them. And then the book happens. And the thing we've been waiting for. Finally, some scary moments. There's a killer. (laughs) whoop de doo <laughs> Yes. The Black Annis is back again, creeping around the castle. And no one can tell that it's the Black Anus because everyone's dressed up as monsters, so it has free reign to just walk around. But before the Black Anus starts killing the students, first it kills Barbara in the most anticlimactic kill ever. This character that we've been following, that's been changing and learning, is killed off camera so that we don't find out who the Black Anus is for another 20 pages. They couldn't give her at least a real death scene. Nope. And it's just, boom, she's dead. So then we get flashbacks from Connor, which fill in every which fills in all the details of Barbara's investigation. And it turns out that Fergus was a sex murderer. Fergus, the original owner of the castle. Fergus was responsible for the 10 deaths that Barbara's been investigating. And it turns out... He's still alive and he's going to kill some more people like Barbara. Starting with Barbara... Weren't there, but wasn't, weren't there two black anises? Because one of them is the old lady, and one of them is Fergus. Yeah. But I could never tell which was which at which point in the book. The old lady was the one that looked in at Barbara in her house. Fergus is the one that broke in and stole Brian Boru. I believe it was Fergus that Scott chased in the woods because he had the blonde hair. The yellow hair. Yeah. So I imagine it looks like ramen noodles. And Fergus is the one that fondled Valerie while she was still tied up on his grave. And the rest is Fergus, too. It's only the old woman when she's trying to get into Barbara's house. Next, the old woman is killed and butchered and cut up into pieces. Yep. Wouldn't want to explore that at all. Um... Just dead. After Derek finds out about that, he then discovers Barbara, calls the police in. And then the book happens, where Fergus wanders around killing teens. Well, he starts with Derek, and he just grabs a lance off the wall, throws it through Derek's chest. You wouldn't realize it based on the first 
300 pages, but the this is a slasher style horror. It's not a psychological thriller about a crazy kid or a fantasy horror with monsters. It's just a regular old slasher. We have a Michael Myers type person walking around in a spooky house killing teens. Someone mistakes Connor for Fergus, blows him away with a shotgun. The security guard. And then we never see the security guard again. Tracy confronts Fergus, and then she gets a Viking axe to the head. Um, Sweet kills. While he's, you know, grabbing all these weapons off the wall and breaking all these antiques, it really added to what a bad idea it was to hold the dance in this location and let these kids run around in the dark. Yeah, with only three or four adults in the whole compound. Then the bullies confront the Black Anis. It almost tries to portray the bullies as, yeah, they're bad, but they got a good heart because they tried to defend Tracy, but it doesn't play off at all. At least one of them is killed, which is a lot better revenge than them getting tagged and it was embarrassing. Yeah, typical slasher where you have some shitty teens that you hate and they get killed by a big, somewhat supernatural guy. That's when Brian Boru comes to the rescue. Yep. Scott finds his mother and Derek both dead and goes crazy thinking he's Brian Boru. And it, of course, doesn't help that everyone's dressed up as monsters. But Fergus is also crazy where he thinks all the kids are are anarchists and terrorists. And he grabs Valerie, our damsel in distress, Mm-hmm. And Scott goes after them. He uses all the weapons that he got from Connor, the slingshot, and his sword, and finally uses his shillelagh to club Fergus to death. Yep. During this final fight, he has his... His, his moment of clarity. Yes, where he finally accepts his father's death, and he lets Brian Boru go, and then he kills a big scary old man. The end. Epilogue. (laughs) The epilogue is just a letter to Valerie. Scott just went back to Spencertown, lives off of his inheritance and Barbara's life insurance. And suit money. Yeah. He got a bunch of money from suing the shit out of Fergus. And then he moves past Hobgoblin. It's not even real. Nope. Now that his mother's dead, he can finally accept his father's death and he doesn't need make-believe. The end. For real. I think this and the obviousness that John Coyne has never played a role-playing game or had, like, one really, really bad experience. (laughs) It's sort of a light to Mazes and Monsters. I think it is trying to say that role-playing games are dangerous or not good for children, but not so strong-handed as Amazes and Monsters. Really? I mean... I think so with Scott's, like, realization that he doesn't need it and it just being a coping mechanism and all the problems he had with other students. I think John Coyne is trying to paint these games as a negative thing and something to move on from, to grow out of. (laughs) Maybe. Did we miss anything? Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Before we end this godforsaken book. (laughs) Uh, did you want to add anything? No, just (laughs) kill me. (laughs) Is that it? Um, well, before we should, who do you think this book is for? Oh. We should do our thing. I'm not sure who this book is for. In the book, there's a quote from the library journal saying horror fans and D&D aficionados will want it. I think people who are into role-playing games would get a sort of sick pleasure out of that chapter 13, that horrible game they play. It's like when people compare their worst role-playing game (laughs) stories, then this is the worst (laughs) one. As a cautionary tale. (laughs) Was that the true horror of this book that experience 
who do you think this book is for? Uh, golfers. <laughs> I can't wait to never read this book or think about it again. If you want to join us for our next episode, we are reading Tesseract by Joseph Addison. <sighs> yes. That's it. That's it. The end. Mocha. <laughs> <laughs>